But if he escapes, I don't know, it looks bad for them, their way of life. Now, the reason the book that I had put out called Negroes with Guns, we were having a demonstration at a swimming pool. And a crowd, I guess, three or four thousand whites trying to take us. It was just, uh, I was bringing three high school students to a swimming pool. Others were already demonstrating. They wrecked my car on the highway in the intersection, and the police, two policemen standing there, and they looked out and wrecked the car, but they didn't know we were armed. So then the crowd started to close in. They said, kill the niggas, burn the niggas, pour gasoline on the niggas. And they were screaming and hollering, so I got out of the car, and I had an Italian carbine, and I also had carried a, a German Luger and an Army 45, and I told the guys in the back to take it, but not to shoot until they saw me shoot. Don't shoot unless I shoot. If I shoot, you kill as many as you can because they're going to get us. So they took the gun, but I told the guy to pass me my carbine as I got out of the car. And when he passed me the carbine, I didn't know he had put one in the chamber, so he put one in the chamber when he was passing it to me, so I'd be ready. And I went to put one in there, and this bullet about this long fell out on the ground, and the white people started looking at me, and they're looking at the bullet, and they're looking at the driver, and they stopped. They had come up near the car. Then the policeman ran. He ran down, and he was about 50 feet away. The two policemen, one ran to the front and said, surrender your arm. And I said, this is a mob. We're not surrendering to a mob. If you want my driver, you come by my house, I'll let you have it, but not here. And then the other one ran around to the side of the car and started to pull his gun out of the holster and shoot me in the back. And this young high school boy had this 45 and he put it in his face and his hand was trembling. He said, if you don't put that gun back in your holster, I'll blow your brains out. So the policeman had to put the gun back. He started backing away. He could see death because that boy would have shot him for sure. And he started backing away and he fell in the ditch. And when he fell in the ditch, there was an old man very old white man. I guess he was drinking and drunk. And he started crying. I mean, he was just crying like a baby. And he said, oh, 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 what is this goddamn country coming to? The niggas got guns and the police can't even arrest them. Now, <clears throat> it took me a long time to understand his feeling. Now I realize why he was crying. Because the gun had been the thing that had always kept them on top and the police power. And he could see that slipping away. And his way of life was going. And this is why he was crying. And this is why I named the book Negroes with Guns. Because it meant when they got guns the same as everybody else, they'd be treated the same way. And it would be to the advantage of the general public to maintain peaceful relations. So, now that doesn't mean guns for the sake of guns, it doesn't mean violence, but it means a controlled situation, well-disciplined and well-led. But what we've got now is anarchy. A lot of people with guns shooting everybody and all kinds of things and robbing and doing everything else, but that won't pay off. There's no dividend in that. Good. We'll stop right here. Would you like some water? Mr. Williams, what would you say to uh, a, a youngster who uh, was uh, who were to tell you at this point that you know, well, hell, I don't want to get involved. I really don't. You know, I, I want to get my own. I want to be done with it. I want to get my house. I want to get my car, and I want to live my own life. I really don't. You know, the community doesn't care about me. Why should I care about the community? Uh, all I'm going to get is grief. I mean, look at Williams. He got he he did all this stuff and he got nothing for it. What would you say to him? Oh, I got a great deal for it. I've had a good time, and I've enjoyed life. One uh, main thing is they ask me, how could you travel around the world? You didn't have a passport. I said I had an FBI wanted poster, and that gave me entrance to a lot of places that other people couldn't go. So as a result of that, yeah, well, I really in, enjoy life. I live now in the middle of the Manistee National Forest, I go places freely, and every two, of the, every two or three years, my wife and I are invited to China. We're treated as heads of state. So <clears throat> I don't know how much better I could do. And uh, they kept, they used economic pressure, all kinds of things. But uh, I got to be well known. I've been given all kinds of 
opportunity, just like they didn't tell the people in the black community, but they invited me to Washington and asked me to help them to normalize relations with China. And uh, they gave me a Ford Foundation grant to the University of Michigan so that they would know about China and I could help them improve relations. So <clears throat> you don't really lose. I would say be honest, be honest with themselves, the others, to be sincere, to vote themselves to truth, and to justice, and most of all, to have some discipline. They gotta have a discipline in life, and never be afraid. But I would also ask them a question. Would, what, how could a fish say that he doesn't want to get involved in the water in the pond? Because the fish is a part of the pond. He's there. If the water's gone, he's gone. And as little as they know it, if this society is gone, they're gone. And this is one thing, too, that <clears throat> I don't understand about white people in this country, especially rich white people. I don't know why they can't have enough understanding to know. If we are destroyed, so will the nation be destroyed. So will they be destroyed. That they can't enjoy what they've got if we're being destroyed. And they don't, I don't know why they can't see that their destiny is tied to ours. Now, it looks like they are some distance, that they've got some insulation. But I can assure them, they don't have any insulation. I've been in countries where I've seen uh, authority break down. They don't know what that looks like. That's a horrible face. And we are not far from that now in this country. We're not far, we're looking at other countries, and attention is being diverted way to other countries, but we're not far away. And it's important for the youth to understand that no matter how distant these people may look who are committing crimes, who are addicted to drugs, and who are in the criminal element, no matter how distant they may look today, they're going to find that they're going to get closer and closer, and this is also the world of the rich man is going to get smaller. The more crime that you got out there, the more drugs that you got out there, the smaller the world is going to get for people who would like to be productive, who would like to live in peace. So there's no such thing of peace without justice. And the young person now must work for justice and for a new world. And without that, we all are lost.